our fourth panelist is uh, um, As uh, who um, until recently was the Secretary General of the IFRC, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, who's been for a long time with the United Nations in various capacities and is currently the chair of the uh, board of the Kofi Annan Foundation and um, I must say a long-standing friend. So us, it's a pleasure having you on the panel. Thank, thank you very much, Michelle. And I would like to thank also the uh, previous speakers who have touched on uh, the most important you know, aspect of the subject matter we are discussing today. So my task will be a little bit easier because I don't have to repeat you know, all of that, but maybe just you know, comment uh, on uh, some of the other issues which I feel you know, are relevant. And I will start uh, by maybe quoting Mr. Monbrial, who in the introduction uh, talked about the shocks that uh, we are confronted with you know, over time. Yes, I agree, we will always be confronted with uh, political shocks. We will always be confronted with climate shock. We will always be com confronted with health shocks. But the question is, will those shocks uh, necessarily become crisis or will they be leading to catastrophic situations or to unprecedented you know, pandemic like the ones uh, in the middle of which we are? The answer I believe you know, lies in many things that we all have alluded to. I believe that answer lies in preparedness or lack thereof. I believe it lies in responsible leadership or lack thereof. It lies in active citizenship that must go hand in hand you know, with responsible leadership. It lies in science that should be guiding you know, our analysis as well as our response. It lies in politics, politics that can be part of the solution or part of the problem. And we are hoping and aspiring to those politics that will be part of the solution. So it lies in action and activism, or lack thereof. So we are seeing children on the street reminding us the importance of the climate. We see young people living with HIV AIDS, you know, telling us that they're experts because they host the virus in their own bodies. By the way, yesterday was World AIDS Day, talking about the pandemic and there are still 38 million people affected, infected and many more affected. It lies in partnership, or lack thereof, it lies in solidarity. It lies in local action and global action as well. And, and I would say it lies in trust, but there will be no trust without accountability. It is in the context, in the, in, in the against that context that we see how we respond or we react. We often react than responding, honestly, because we find ourselves in what we call a cycle of panic and neglect. When we are confronted with an unprecedented shock, we all panic and we put all our resources and our attention focusing on one. When it subsides, well, you know, we seem to go back, you know, to whatever we consider to be normal. And this time we are being reminded that maybe we shouldn't go back to normal because normal has not worked. We have now to move forward and then shaping a future that we really would like you know, to see. COVID-19 has revealed all of that. And it has also exacerbated some of those dysfunctionalities you know, that we have seen in our national and in our international institutions. It has shown that there is a real breakdown in leadership. Frankly. The world is crying, crying you know, for leadership and we don't have a critical mass you know, of leaders, political and otherwise at the global level that could you know, chart the way forward. So what we're seeing is now, and it's functional in our national and international institutions that is mainly caused you know, by not the institutions you know, themselves or the bureaucracy themselves, but the very members you know, that should be either funding, supporting, guiding, and also giving the authority to those institutions you not know, to do the work they're supposed to be doing. Mr. Mombreal has invited us you know, not to be naive. Well, 
I think I would like to be naive. I would like to be naive, you know, to believe that, you know, the United Nations had a charter that started with we the people and not with the government. And then we will have maybe go back, you know, to putting the people at the center of what we do to make sure that, you know, leadership is about delivering on promises that we make to people and people's well-being. And if we do not break, we should not deliver on those promises. We don't have the trust that is required. And unfortunately, we will have a deficit. We are having a deficit, you know, of trust right now. So in the global system, you know, that we are seeing now. We started, I think I can belong to the generation that started learning or studying international relations with the first chapter being called the world order. And we're talking about the global order even, but I think today what we are seeing or risking to see is that global order is turning into not to a global disorder. Why? Because the very member states and the very partners and the very members, you know, of an institution that make it work, you know, turn to be the very ones, you know, that are weakening it. And we've seen that. WHO is a good example of that. Well, if I list, you know, the three biggest funders of WHO, well, among them, I will find the non-member states. I will find the private foundation. Well, and those were supposed, you know, to maybe leading. We see in the result examples are even withdrawing their funding and questioning their membership of the organization that is called the World Health Organization. But at the same time, we expect an authority and a guidance from this organization, and that will not you know, happen you know, that, that way. So what we are saying also is that I'm glad you know, that Mr. Kramars has mentioned that the centrality of human behavior in that it is not only the behavior to prevent you know, disease, it is our behaviors and attitudes what we, and we, when we face you know, shocks and hazards and how we respond to that rather than reacting you know, to them. Changing our behaviors when it's right, it happens. What is most difficult is to sustain it. We may have heard, you know, the saying many times, you no, know, stop smoking is very easy. I did it 10 times. And that's what we are facing now, even in the times of COVID, we're talking about second wave. Well, I have full respect of the experts that say so, but I believe we're still in the first wave, the same wave, because nothing has changed, you know, in the general virus. Nothing has changed in the way it is transmitted. Not must have changed in the way it can be prevented. But what has changed is dramatically our behaviors. When we relapse, when we relax, it will relapse. And that we are seeing now happening, you know, more and more, you know, that uh, in the different situations, you know, that we are facing. I also be naive, want to be naive to believe that there will be a growing critical global citizenship beyond borders that will be challenging leadership and then putting that networks in order of solidarity that are required and putting the pressure and decision-making levels, all decision-making levels, local communities, private sector, government, international institutions, you know, so that equity and inclusion is not only a wish, but it is something that we apply to make sure, you know, that we all are safe. Michelle, in the introduction, you were talking about, well, that is not surprising to see who will be the winner if the competition, you know, start and continue the way it is starting. You know, my answer is, no, there will be no win at all because we tend to forget that in a pandemic, indeed, no one, no, no, none of us is safe, you know, until we all are. So what we are seeing now when we're talking about the multilateral system, maybe two things that we will be thinking about moving forward. A global response is more than a UN response. So multilateralism is way beyond the UN. Of course, we need the UN. We need international financial institutions. We need multinationals that are even becoming subject of international law and very important actors in international relations. We need, you know, pharma. We need, you know, the economies, you know, all of that, that so that it becomes a true global response. In the same vein, we will have also to need that a national response is more than a government response. We will have to have communities you know, at the center. We will have to heal 
you know, the trust which is broken between leaders at national level and their citizens. And finally, what I would like maybe to continue thinking of and then reflecting together with you, that we always continue to try to strike the balance that we need the science. Definitely, we shouldn't take that for granted. Science is being challenged by so many naysayers, by anti-vax campaigners, you know, by social media amplifying all kinds of fake news. And we need politics but politics that are part of the problem, part of the solution and not the problem. And we need the activism, you know, that will be holding us, you know, all accountable for. And I think, you know, that is maybe the utopia and naivety, you know, that I truly believe in and that will be required, you know, to guide us, you know, so that all of that will be leading to local action and global response, as well as, you know, the solidarity that is required. So finally, if COVID is really a global public bad, maybe we need a response that is called a global public good. And how that doesn't matter how we define it. If it is in the spirit of solidarity, in the spirit of equity, in the spirit of just making sure that we all are safe. And you know, egoistic way of making sure that you know the investment that we are making within our geographic border are fine you know, will not be challenged by the lack of, lack of investment in action somewhere else, you know, in the world. Because again, none of us is safe until we all are. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, As. Um, thank you for uh, the important points you raised on uh, trust, on um, the uh, global citizenship uh, building up uh, and that echoes some of uh, of what uh, Jean Clamarck said earlier uh, around the weaker and weaker acceptability by uh, global citizens that that goods uh, public goods are just managed by on the basis of free trade thank you for your comments on the need at national and global level to uh, to see beyond governments and intergovernmental multilateralism, um, uh, but to a broader uh, common citizen partnership involving uh, all, all sectors and responsible citizens that trust each other and, and, and trust in the project. Thank you also for introducing a new terminology, a global public bad. Thank you.